So let's begin, like we always do, with Ye. What's going on with him lately? Well, one thing that's semi-related to him is that Parler managed to accidentally dox a lot of its members in announcing the Kanye West takeover. So the artist formerly known as Kanye West has decided to purchase Parler, apparently. Parler got excited about this, so they wanted to let everybody know. They sent out an email, and in sending that email out, you know how you can put email addresses in the to line, or you can put them in the CC line, or you can put them in the BCC line. Well, they should have been all in the BCC line, uh, but they were all in the two line. So it went out and everybody could see everybody else's email address. That's not a problem, right? I mean, that's not a problem. Unless somebody out there, like Adam Ryan, decides that he will take the email he got and post screenshots of it on the internet. So there's that. Um, hmm... So 300 of its VIP members had their personal email addresses exposed to the world. And, and that's probably not super bad, but it's also probably not great either. So there you go. The question I have for you is, was that wrong? Right? Was that, was that a bad thing? Did Parler do anything bad? Another way to think about it is, did the members on Parler have a reasonable expectation that Parler would take steps to protect their registered email addresses. And, you know, is that going to hurt him? Are those people going to abandon Parler or are they going to stay with them? Time will tell. So, to figure that out, let's take a look at Parler's privacy policy. And it explicitly says, we make reasonable efforts to protect your personal information using methods However, no method of transmission or storage of data is 100% secure, especially not when you explicitly send it out by email. And we will not be responsible for any damage that results from a security breach of data or the unauthorized access to or use of information, whether personal information or device identifiable information. That seems to sound like if there is unauthorized access, but this was clearly authorized access so well their point of view on it is no we didn't really do anything wrong it might have been inconvenient maybe we didn't mean to do it but you know what tough uh what about the california consumer privacy act what about rights in the european economic area what about those kinds of things those apply well, you have the right to obtain your information and you have the right to have your information forgotten and that's mostly all there is. So we settle on the C policy. And that takes us to part one, data privacy. Let's think about data privacy and what it means. Is it good? What do we do about it? Is it important to think about that as you're building your, your software system? Probably. So online privacy is really just the ability to control who has access to data, your data, stored online. You want to control who can identify you online and who can associate you with a particular account or with data. Right? If I can go find some tweets and say, these tweets by, by Juniper61604, they're really tweets by you know, uh, pick public figure, I don't know, Mitch McConnell. Well, you know, now I've violated, uh, in a sense, uh, his privacy. Potentially, right? I mean, is there anything wrong with it? Eh, think about that for a few minutes. Here's a question for you. I'm, I'm making the eh sound a lot. Does privacy matter? Should we take steps to even protect privacy? Should software we write be designed to protect the privacy of individuals who use that software? Maybe in the sense that we might get sued, but maybe not in the sense that maybe privacy doesn't matter. If you're going to argue privacy doesn't matter, that's fine. You're welcome to argue that. We have to consider some, some examples. Let's pick on Drizzly. 
So it turns out here's another example of the FTC swooping in and bringing action against a company. Oh, no, wait, not against the company, excuse me, against the CEO of the company specifically. That's right, the FTC singled out James Corey Reyes and went against him. And the decision applies to him. If he leaves Drizzly and goes somewhere else, this follows him. So they said, you know what? It's on you, James. Uh, the proposal will follow him to future businesses, requiring him to implement a security program at any companies he runs that collect information from more than 25,000 people. Under the terms, Reyes and Drizzly have to destroy any unnecessary data, implement new data controls, and train employees about cybersecurity. In singling him out, they suggested they might be willing to provide tougher oversight of the industries. So what is Drizzly? Drizzly is a company that ships alcohol to you. Fine. I mean, maybe I don't want you to know that yeah, I'm having lots of alcohol shipped to me, but, but maybe that's not so terrible. So we asked the question again, was that wrong? And to find out, we go to Drizzly's privacy policy. We maintain a number of administrative, physical, and technological measures to protect the confidentiality, privacy, and security of personal information. Again, nothing is perfect, uh, and we cannot guarantee your stuff won't be disclosed. But we say we're going to take reasonable measures to protect it, and then if we say we are and we don't, that's when the FTC was going to come after us. And so the FTC investigates alleged privacy violations and is going after executives and companies that say they will protect privacy and then don't. So that's something you should think about. Maybe we have to worry about privacy just because of the FTC. But also, state legislation is being considered, right? There's there's the potential for legislation. And that takes us to the link on there, and that will show us where legislation is being considered. And if you go to that link, you'll see this map, or some version of it. It can change uh, anytime new legislation is produced. And so you'll see, you know, no comprehensive bills in Tennessee. Whew, we dodged a bullet there. Inactive bills in Kentucky and Georgia. Signed bills in Virginia and Colorado and Utah and California and Connecticut and bills being introduced here across the Rust Belt. So there you have it, right? There's, there is an attempt to get privacy legislation uh, enacted into law. And if we do it this way, we wind up with, you know, 51 different versions of legislation, maybe more. Uh, right? Because we have 50 states and D.C. and we have Puerto Rico and, and others. And so that patchwork of privacy laws will make it hard for businesses to do anything, right? Ideally, businesses would like to have a national law they can comply with, and that would be great. Right now, here are some laws that you have to think about. Right? Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. If you're, if you're storing data about kids, okay. The Health Insurance Portability and Accounting Act. I always like to point out that the P in HIPAA is not privacy. A lot of people think it is. It's portability. There's the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. Has to do with financial data. The Fair Credit Reporting Act. The California Consumer Privacy Act. The California Privacy Rights Act. And so on. Right? Lots of stuff, including that one at the bottom there, the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, and that's an EU law to protect privacy. So, FTC is coming after you. What, what makes them mad? How do we avoid getting noticed? Don't engage in misleading and deceptive advertising practices. Don't say, hey, we are ultimately secure when you're not actually doing anything that looks like security. So don't make inaccurate privacy and security representations to customers, right? Inaccurate representations of a service, doesn't matter if it's privacy or not. That's something the FTC cares about. Deceptive advertising, they care about it. Failure to follow your own policies, that's going to tick them off. 
violating consumer data privacy rights by collecting and sharing information illegally, you're already behaving illegally, you're going to make them mad. Those are all things that can make the FTC want to come after you. So, the privacy landscape is complicated and the privacy landscape is changing. And you may need to respond to changes in privacy laws. What does this mean for your software? Your software should be able to partition and to protect sensitive information. So ideally, when you know you have information that might be considered sensitive, you store that in a way within your, your system, within your database, within your files, wherever. You store that separately. You can link to it from other databases, but if you store it separately, then if things change, you have it in this way where you can provide greater security, greater accountability, greater auditing for that particular set of information. What in particular should I be worried about? PII, personally identifiable information. That's information that can be connected to identify a specific individual, protected health information, right? Diagnoses, medications, that sort of stuff and information about children, period. Any information about kids. Those are things you need to worry about. So there is a thing, the American Data Privacy Protection Act, and you know, this would require informed express consent for information disclosure. So there would be another box you would check where they would say, in accordance with the American Data Privacy Protection Act, uh, we collect your data and share it with our partners uh, click here to acknowledge uh, that you are aware of this and and give uh, your express consent. And you would click the box and that would be how the law was enacted, I guess. Uh, but it's in Congress. It's not enacted yet. Uh, it's a law being considered. It would be a national law, so it would override these, many of these state laws. And that would give a framework for a lot of companies to then comply with. I want you to think about this for a few moments. There are people in the world who are in serious danger. I mean, in terms of like threats on their lives, they could be seriously hurt or killed through no fault of their own, just because of an accident of birth, if their privacy is breached. Seriously, right? Think about people living in some countries where there are oppressed minorities. Think about people living in this country who uh, may who may have uh, unpopular views of the world, right? Think about people who are trans or who are gay. Uh, there are people who can be in serious danger uh, because of their beliefs if their privacy is breached, right? There can be people who can be in serious danger because of just who they are if their privacy is breached. Protecting the privacy of your users is your moral, that is, in the duty that we have to each other, and your ethical responsibility, right? What are the ethics? Those are the rules that society or your professional organization like the IEEE uh, require. So we do have a moral and ethical duty to protect the privacy of our users. You're creating a system that's going to be used by people and that obligates you to those people. You know, pick your favorite moral code, right? Go pick your favorite moral philosopher. Odds are good, you're obligated. But of course, this is America and you know freedom if you want the people to do the right thing ultimately you have to provide them with incentives and specifically the incentives would be a business model that promotes protecting privacy and if we had something like that well then we would we'd be all over it okay anyway let's on that happy note let's shift gears and let's talk about data security so we talked about data privacy about data security and the first question is aren't those the same thing well here's the way I'm going to think about it and you can think about it however you like I find this to be a useful way to think about it data security protects data from compromise by hackers and insiders 
It is literally securing that data. Data privacy governs how data is collected, shared, and used. Okay, a little bit different things. And so we need different techniques for each. Another piece of motivation to help you see that maybe privacy is not dead and maybe it's important is that businesses have proprietary information. I'll pick on something I mentioned previously, the recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. 11 herbs and spices. Uh, and this can include inventions, like said recipe, business processes, right? Um, it turns out supermarkets lose money on a lot of stuff in the store. They make money on some stuff, and they're always trying to negotiate better deals with their suppliers to undercut their competitors in this, uh, in this or that product. And those deals are very secretive, right? If supplier X is willing to shave off a few uh, pennies when selling to Kroger, they don't necessarily want Ingalls to know that they did that because maybe they can make up the difference in selling to Ingalls. Planning, right? When Disney was buying up a bunch of land in Florida to build Disney World, they tried to keep it very quiet because if people found out Disney was buying this land, people would go in and buy the land first so they could jack the price up uh, and sell it to Disney. Or people who own the land would jack the price up. Uh, and anything else you don't want your competitors to know, and there's probably a lot of that. So this is all privacy. In this case, it's companies who want to keep information private. And it can include information that might embarrass your company. You don't necessarily want your regulators to see everything going on because you may not be intentionally violating any of the regulations or rules or laws, but people are people. And there can be, you know, small infractions and they're not necessarily reportable, right? You don't necessarily need, have a need to report them uh, to oversight. But if they could see everything, if your regulator could see everything going on, they might see that and it could get you in trouble. So not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying anything nefarious about this. There are times when, you know, it makes sense to have uh, privacy in your company. And since you want privacy in your company, by implication, your corporate officers need privacy. And those are just people. And so their families and others, and pretty soon your employees, privacy is, 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 should not be dead, right? It's something that, that we need. All right, enough soapbox. Information is a business asset. You might collect information from your customers or purchase that information. In both cases, that information is an asset that you want to protect. It's worth money, right? Some companies run services for free and they can do so because they collect data and then they turn around and sell that data. Uh, let's pick on Twitter because uh, they're going through some potential navel gazing right now uh, as they might or might not be bought by Elon Musk. Right now, Twitter makes its money from a couple different sources. One of them is the sale of advertising services and the other is data licensing. Well, the data licensing actually informs the first one, right? They're only able to encourage advertisers because they believe the data they're collecting allows them to better target those companies' ads. So in other words, they are monetizing their data either indirectly by selling advertising or directly by selling the data itself. And they don't want people to just get it for free. So. I'm going to make an obnoxious argument. Obnoxious argument. Forgive me. My argument is that reputational risk does not matter much. Wells Fargo had some very, very negative press about the way they treated people during the mortgage crisis and about some of their deceptive uh, practices. Adobe has suffered a, you know, constant stream of negative press about security of their applications. LinkedIn, right? They've got a lot of negative press about a number of things. And they've been, you know, used to perpetrate some scams, etc. Equifax is still around. They had a major, major data breach. The University of Phoenix, despite being sued and sued and sued and sued and losing, is still in operation. All of these 
can have bad reputations online for deserved or undeserved reasons, and they still operate. If you're familiar with Star Wars Battlefront, there's another example. Battlefront 2, those of you who know, you know. Uh, if you don't, don't worry about it. Right? And still, right? I mean, I still play Battlefront. Okay, anyway. The point here is data is worth money. And companies want to protect their own data, even if they don't worry as much about protecting your data. Data loss can harm the competitive advantage of companies, uh, and, and they care about that. They may care about regulatory compliance, but honestly, reputational risk and all these other things that you may think about a uh, data breach, those are maybe secondary effects. A serious effect is the actual loss of the data itself. That's problematic, right? That's a, that's the real problem. What about leaking data? Uh, so let's think about that for a minute. Providing a single person's data online is one thing, but the aggregated data of all of your millions of users—that's what's really valuable. And you might think, well. Twitter, all those tweets are public. Why don't I just scrape the web for all those tweets and aggregate that data and that will be the service I provide. Great. Someone has done that, not for Twitter, but for LinkedIn. HiQ. <laughs> so let's talk about HiQ versus LinkedIn from 2019, pre-COVID time. September 19th, the U.S. Ninth Circuit in 2019, a lot of nines here, Court of Appeals ruled that web scraping public sites does not violate the Consumer Fraud and Abuse Act. And that's pretty reassuring, right? What was happening was HiQ was scraping LinkedIn and they were building their own view of that data and then turning around and monetizing that, selling that as a resource to others. This is a big decision. Uh, the court legalized the, the practice of scraping that information for the purpose of building a business. HiQ's business model was scraping LinkedIn. <laughs> it still is. Uh, it also, and this is the interesting part, prohibited competitors from removing information from the site if the site's public. What? The court confirmed in clear logic that the entry of the web scraper is not legally different from the entry of the browser. In both cases, the user requests open data and then does something with it on their side. And they prohibited LinkedIn from interfering with HiQ's web scraping. Think about that for a minute. They said HiQ can scrape, the, can scrape LinkedIn's information and also they can't interfere with it. And that last paragraph explains that. HiQ argued that LinkedIn's technical measures to block web scraping interfere with HiQ's contracts with its customers who rely on this data. They basically said, hey, our business model is scraping LinkedIn's data. If they stop us from scraping that data, they are interfering with our contracts. Malicious interference with the contract. And they won. They won. So there you go. Fascinating, I think, decision. It doesn't grant HiQ or other web crawlers the freedom to use that data any way they see fit because that data might be copyrighted. So I might go to YouTube and I might scrape it and grab those videos, but I can't turn around and make them available because they have copyrights associated with them, and I don't have the right to use that data. So, a little bit uh, tangled up with uh, intellectual property law, but there you go. All right. There are references that are given throughout the slides, so not a whole lot of references this time. And that's it.